You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Frank Wilczek. Frank Wilczek is a theoretical physicist, author, and intellectual adventurer. He has received many prizes for his work, including a Nobel Prize in Physics and, most recently, the Templeton Prize. Wilczek has made seminal contributions to fundamental particle physics, cosmology, and the physics of materials. His current research focus includes axions, anions, and time crystals, There are concepts in physics which he named and pioneered. Each has become a major focus of worldwide research. In recent years, Frank has become fascinated with prospects for expanding perception through technology. He is developing hardware and software tools for this. He has authored several well-known books and writes a monthly Will Checks Universe feature for the Wall Street Journal. He received his B.S. at the University of Chicago in 1970 and a Ph.D. in Physics at Princeton University in 1974. Currently, he's the Hermann Feschbach Professor of Physics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, founding director of the T.D. Lee Institute and chief scientist at Wilczek Quantum Center, Shanghai Jiao Tong University, distinguished professor at Arizona State University, and professor at Stockholm University. On Event Horizon, I speak to a variety of scientists, from theoretical physicists to experimentalists, who build and test many of the subjects we discuss. You'll be hearing how important it is for the theoretical physicists to work closely with the experimentalists in this episode with Professor Frank Wilczek, as he has been working for years with his colleagues to build a detector to possibly solve one of our universe's great mysteries. What exactly dark matter is made of? The understanding that there is a need to test a hypothesis starts at an early age for students. While researching Frank's life, I was struck by just how supportive his parents were in encouraging his curiosity. That's why I'm quite happy we are sponsored by Mel Science in today's video. Their subscription service offers monthly science boxes, which really gives a young student the hands-on experiments they need to help them engage in their desire to study science. They strive to make science accessible, interesting, and cool. Because after all, science is really about exploration and discovery, desires that everyone grows up with. So help to nurture that natural curiosity and interest in science by giving your kids something fun to do with hands-on experiments. And with different categories for different age groups, including Mel Chemistry, Mel Physics, Mel Medicine, and Coding. We received the Gyroscope Kit, and my producer's nieces loved it. They created their own toy gyroscope, with the kit helping them to understand just how gyroscopes are used in real life, something that's very important. Indeed, you can even take free VR lessons in the Mel VR app, and while having fun and meaningful time spent together with the family. So thanks to Mel Science for sponsoring this video. Check them out by scanning the QR code on screen, or by clicking the link in the description below and using the promo code JAMG which gives you a 50% discount for the first month on any subscription plan. Dr. Frank Wilczek, welcome to the program. Nice to be here, so to speak. (laughs) Now, doctor, my first question for you is about mathematics and how dependent we are in attempting to describe the universe using mathematics. But is it possible that, at least partially, the universe can't really be expressed in that way? It's certainly possible, logically, (laughs) that uh, you might need to bring in ideas that that would be hard to recognize as mathematics. But so far, uh, we've we've come quite far in formulating the fundamental laws of how the world works in a very mathematical language. No no limitation has shown up. (laughs) That that's keeping us from going further. <laughs> well, is it, yeah, that's what I, what I was getting at, is, a, is, it, is it 
is it within the realm of possibility that that one of the reasons that we run into stumbling blocks and things like understanding gravity and things like that is because maybe our methodology falls short and we yeah, at least should ask the question. Well, it's definitely possible. We'll need new intellectual tools, but probably when we find them, we'll call them mathematics. <laughs> they just might might not be things that we would call mathematics right now. <laughs> mathematics is a, is always expanding, so it 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 was only really no, in the in the seventeenth century that it started to include calculus. It's it's only in the 19th century that it began to include symbolic logic in you know, 20th century mathematics has incorporated even new concepts, some that have had major impact in physics, especially the, the mathematics of uh, symmetry. So, so yes, we may we may we almost surely will need new new concepts and new tools, but insofar you know mathematics really is just a word for abstract logical thinking and i think whatever new tools uh, we'll we we uh, invent in the future we'll probably call them mathematics they just might not be the mathematics of the present now that's that that brings us into describing and attempting to describe parts of the universe that we don't have a complete understanding of things like dark mm -hmm. matter and such mm -hmm. now what, in your opinion, should be the focus of theoretical physics today? Meaning, what aspect of the universe is, is perplexing but seems maybe to be a key to understanding even more? What, what should the focus be? Well, in answering a question like that, there has to be a balance between we would like to know and what we have realistic, pro what, 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 where we can see a clear path ahead. I think in the specific thing you mentioned, the problem of dark matter, we have some very promising ideas, and in particular, I, I, well, I'm, I'm prejudiced, right? but I, I have uh, long been advocating the, the, the possibility of a particle called axion supplying the dark matter, and I think that's only looked better and better with the passage of time, and it's now a very exciting time for that idea because the technology for Requ the, the technology that's required in order to test the hypothesis experimentally is is really finally coming into focus. And so one of the things I've been doing in, uh, the, in, in recently in the past year or two is helping experimentalists design the kinds of antennas you need in order to tune into the axion dark matter. There are other great problems we would like i think another great kind of problem that's at the interface between advanced physics and engineering is the problem of taking full advantage of the potentials of quantum mechanics so we in principle the equations tell us how to design new drugs new materials to basically replace chemistry laboratories by banks of computers just to calculate things instead of doing messy experiments but we need better computers maybe qualitatively better computers based so-called quantum computers in order to uh, fulfill that potential and building the quantum computers is something that uh, is probably going to call call on very advanced physics to do it so there's kind of a bootstrap procedure where we need we need clever ideas in physics in order to build the machines that will allow us to go further. Then if we step outside of physics, well, I mean, so those are questions that I think we, I, I see clear ways, clear, clear paths to progress, and progress is being made, and it's very uh, inspiring and interesting. Uh, problems that, I, that I'd love to see advanced, but I, I don't see a clear path ahead, are understanding the kind of mishmash of elementary particles we have now and, and parameters in the standard model. The standard model is a uh, an astonishing achievement that we've been able to boil down the basic fundamental laws of the physical world down to uh, a very small number, but, they, but, but we'd like to do even better. And, and uh, this structure has various lopsidedness and an abundance of 
numbers that we have to take from experiments, so we, we would like to do better than that. Uh, we need some basic new ideas to do that. And one thing you kind of alluded to is we would like to have a deeper unification of foundational ideas in our understanding of space-time and gravity, it, you know, general relativity with curved and fluctuating spaces on the one hand, and on the other hand, quantum mechanics, and which when, when you try to put the two together, they cooperate to a certain extent, but, uh, but, but, but they're based on fundamentally different ideas. And there's this, that sort of hints at the idea that there should be a deeper understanding where both, from which both of them flow naturally, and that, that we don't have. And why might that be useful? Well, that might be useful in telling us about the very, very origin of the universe, whether at present we can extrapolate our laws to very, very early times with, with the Big Bang, but the very beginning, you know, what, what puts it all in motion and makes it a coherent package we still don't really have. So that's, those are big open, big open questions within physics. And I'd say maybe the greatest question of all is, is beyond physics, but, 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 but certainly answering it will, will need physics, which is uh, how does mind emerge from matter? We, we still only have very sketchy ideas about how human minds emerge from matter at a molecular level, how you know, ideas and memories uh, are formed and how consciousness emerges, things, like that. things of that nature. We're very early in our understanding of that, I think. There do are other you kinds expect? of intelligence that, and mind that we do understand very well because we built them, namely computers, but uh, we'd like to understand the natural minds also. Would you characterize consciousness, for example, as a property of the universe? Yes. Well, yeah. We, I mean, it's, it's something we all experience, and I think most of us also ascribe to other humans because they seem to be very similar to us. Uh, and so it's a real phenomenon. It's kind of difficult to, to pin down and that's part of the part of the manifestation that we don't really understand it. What you know, what it what it is, but we sort of we experience it, and we would like to have. I, I the way I put it is, I'd like to see myself in the equation somehow. I'd like to see something that has a qualitative kind of emergent property that I would recognize as. Uh, reflecting my experience of consciousness. That gets a little bit odd though, because if you if you look physically speaking, we experience the world quite a bit differently than the universe does. For example, the concept of a now <laughs> doesn't really exist in physics, but it's very important to us, the present, so to speak. And that gets into things like perception and, and all of that. And we know even less about that, I think, than we do <laughs> any ideas well, of consciousness. I guess I would dispute the idea that with the physics doesn't know about now. I mean, we, we can, we can, I mean, it's, it's an approximate notion, but, and, you know, relativity puts limits on, on the ability to define simultaneous simultaneity of distant, distant uh, events, but uh, to a very good approximation, you can, you can make sense of the notion of time, and it, it appears prominently in the equations, and and you can you, you can uh, uh, different. You, I mean, not full scale consciousness because we don't understand what that. That's precisely what we don't understand is how to make minds from matter. But if you if you don't insist on full scale minds, but observing apparatus and kind of simple minds simple quasi minds then then we can perfectly well define now and they can communicate and, and, and have uh, and be synchronous and the internet works everybody all the different parts of it agree on what's going on at the same time so yeah so I, I don't there are things in myster that are mysterious but there are also things that aren't so mysterious I mean, we we understand a lot and we also don't understand a lot it's not that we don't understand anything. We understand uh, a lot. <laughs> yeah. Now, you have uh, 
you've talked about this before, and it's something that's always interested me is go back to Einstein. And mm-hmm. Einstein always talked about things like the God of Spinoza and things like uh, also people have also said that, you know, theoretical physics are the physicists are the only scientists not afraid to use the word God, but not quite yeah. in the sense of, 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 you know, an organized religion, but in a different sense. What, what is your take on that? What do you think about that? Well, there are some theoretical physicists, and, including Einstein and including myself, who dare to use that language because it, it has tremendous resonance within our culture. And there's a very rich literature and tradition that goes along with the concept of God. But, but it, it, has, it, it, has, I said, I said, it has many different definitions. That, that concept has many different definitions for different people. And and I think the the God that Newton understood, which is closer to the traditional God you find in the Old and New Testaments, is very different from the God that Einstein understood, which was, uh, as he, he described it as the God of Spinoza. And really, if you go go look at what Spinoza actually said, he 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 would he, he used the phrase God or the universe as if those were the same thing. So so uh, God, so he's uh, it's kind of a pantheism. So you could so some people called at the time I mean, at the time and still today some people call Spinoza an atheist other people call him a pantheist and really they're describing the same guy because, uh, because it's a notion of god that that is very un, unlike the notion that's in uh, in in, in uh, 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 the dogmatic interpretations of of most re- of uh, most religions but is very much in the spirit that i like and i think einstein i I'm, took it largely influenced by Einstein, is that what we're doing as we try to understand the universe profoundly in, in, in an honest way is we're learning what God is. We're, we're learning, like, accessing God through the works of God, if you like. And, and, uh, we, and it's not disappointing. <laughs> so, so it has a kind of resonance with religious feelings that are often associated with religion, even though it doesn't have a revealed scripture, so to speak. Because when we do think about how the world works profoundly, we find some very beautiful and mind-expanding things and then you know, so it's 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 not disappointing it's not ugly it's profound and uh, and the the deeper you understand it the the better it is you know that, that, that's the perceived order symmetry and elegance of it sort of compels me to agree with you that I, i'm not making any religious statement or anything like that but there is a there is a an uncanny beauty to it all Yes, it's much. It, it's 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 astonishing. I mean, that, that, if that this program that that was in some sense initiated by Democritus, but in in a in a real sense was initiated by people like Galileo and, and Newton in, in in the seventeenth century uh, of understanding. The world by understanding very simple constituents fully, very and, and and very small things fully, and then building up by deduction to a just description of more and more complex things, has worked so well. I mean, it didn't have to be that way, but the program of uh, under, uh, 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 sometimes called the reductionist program, but it's not really reductionist. It's it, in the pejorative sense. It's analysis and then synthesis of understanding the uh, fundamental a few fundamental things which is how uh, little go- little elementary objects interact with each other uh, and then understanding that behavior thoroughly and then working out consequences of fun for bigger and bigger objects and more complicated objects 
it's just it just works <laughs> and, and, and to uh, to uh didn't have to work logically uh, but it does work and, and, and it's given us a really profound and in detail extremely surprising uh, picture of how the world works and this evokes your book the beautiful question what is the beautiful question above and beyond what we've already talked about well the, the beautiful question that that uh, as i posed it in the book is is it fruitful and appropriate to regard the universe as a work of art does does it have so that was the, that's the question <laughs> and of course i wouldn't have posed it without the answer being yes in my mind is that so we find that the best description the most profound description of how the world works at a fundamental level has elements of coherence and symmetry that we we, we associate with uh, artistic deep with uh, with the most excellent artistic productions so, so uh, uh, like like um let's say the music of bach or or the uh art of the decorative art you find in in in, in mosques and in islamic art these uh, where, where symmetry and structure and variation somehow make a very harmonious pattern and and and, the, and that's that's how the universe looks if you if you uh if you get into tune with it so uh that that that's the beautiful question i think and uh yeah, and I, 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 it, 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 it delights me every time I think about it. How, 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 how that is. And it's, and, it's worth uh, noting. Just let me add one more thing. I mean, I've had several occasions in my career to try to make the description of the world more beautiful. So the laws, as understood at the time, had some flaw some aesthetic flaw or i perceived it uh, an aesthetic flaw and in trying to repair that aesthetic flaw i was led to hypotheses about how the laws might be different and those hypotheses turned out to be correct <laughs> so looking for beauty turns out has turned out not only in my career but but of course in many in einstein's career in the career of uh, uh, many heroes of science to 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 be reliable guide to how the how the world actually works so the, 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 the kind of aesthetic feelings of how the world should be turns out to be a, an excellent guide to to uh, discovering how the world is <laughs> it's also worth noting that every work of art that we've ever produced mm -hmm. was done so entirely under the laws of physics in other words the universe allows artistic expression through consciousness and just simply uh, yeah well <laughs> very special yeah, consciousness well, <laughs> though ours uh, ours <laughs> every, well i mean every, every, yeah every work of art is in, that that we know of i is embodied in uh, in the physical world so in that sense yes it's it's what you say it, it, it's true that, that it, at some level they're based in physics and if we accept the idea that mind emerges from matter then that's, then that's a very strong statement on the other hand some of the products of art like poetry uh their, their connection to the physical world is pretty tenuous i mean it's there but it's but if, in the sense that yet that poetry is in minds and minds emerge from matter and if they're written on the page if the poems are written on the page uh and then, of course, that's a physical embodiment. If poems are are written in people's memory, then that, that presumably is a physical uh, uh, embodiment. So I don't dispute that that uh, uh, works of art are uh, also works of physical reality. But sometimes the relationship is not very direct. <laughs> now to switch gears. Back to the axion that we briefly touched on. Okay, yes. <laughs> the axion could very well be a strong candidate for dark matter. Well, so, it is a strong candidate. Whether it's yeah. a correct candidate is yet to be right, seen. Right, right. <laughs> so give us an overview of the axion. How does it fit within the standard model? Well, the axion 
arose first as a theoretical proposal, very much in the spirit of uh, what we've just been discussing. That is that the laws of the, uh, that are embodied in the standard model, they work very, very well, but they have a kind of aesthetic imperfection. That is that there's a kind of a possible coupling among the color gluons, which are an essential part of the standard model, that's what holds us all together, holds, holds our atomic nuclei together, that there's a possible interaction among those gluons. So doesn't that interaction that wouldn't violate any of the principles that, that the, uh, the, the standard model embodies, so it would be and, and all the other kinds of possibilities that are allowed by those principles, namely relativity, quantum mechanics, and something called local gauge symmetry, so high degrees of symmetry, all the other possibilities actually happen. But this is one possibility that doesn't seem to happen. There's a possible interaction that either doesn't happen at all or is very, very much smaller than any reasonable expectation. So. If you put it numerically, there's a numerical parameter that sort of could could have been and should be by rights uh, about equal to one, which turns out experimentally to be less than one divided by ten billion. <laughs> so very 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 much small. So that kind of coincidence. If you, or that kind of grotesque smallness, <laughs> or the the it's it's like the the dog that doesn't bark in the night in, in the Sherlock Holmes story. And, and so so there's something something missing in our understanding. We, there's something that we have to understand why why this number is so small, why this interaction uh, doesn't really occur, doesn't occur. We're missing a principle, and there's a very elegant extent way of extending the standard model to have more symmetry that is pretty simple and very natural and addresses that problem so it's analogous to the kind of thing that led einstein to general relativity that is in that case there was a coincidence that the gravitational mass of objects was always proportional to their inertial mass so that the strength of gravitational forces and, uh, associated with bodies were, all, all, uh, were always related in the same way to their, inert, their resistance to motion, the resistance to changes in, in motion. Here, there's a coincidence that we'd like to explain, and we can explain it by adding to the principles of physics in an elegant way. But there's a, well, not but, but, uh, the good, the the good news and the bad news is that to follow through on that idea, you need to bring in a new kind of particle that has not been observed. That's the axion. So the idea, which is theoretically very elegant and beautiful, is so far still hypothetical because the most crucial prediction of the theory that there is this new particle has not been verified. On the other hand, the theory itself tells you that that particle is kind of very elusive. Its couplings to ordinary matter are very, very weak. And so it sort of explains why we've been frustrated in trying to observe it so far. Now, that was kind of the state of play for the first few years after these ideas were uh, put forward. The basic theoretical ideas. But then some of us studied how these ideas also from fundamental physics also fit into cosmology. So take the equations that we're proposing that uh, go beyond the equations of the standard model a little bit and run those equations through the Big Bang cosmology. What we found when we did that is a beautiful surprise. That is that the the axions would have been produced in the early universe and persisted down to this day in an abundance that could very nicely 
explain the dark matter that the uh, astronomers need and the axions have exactly the right properties to be the dark matter they are produced in abundance in the right abundance they uh persist to this day so they, they, their lifetime is very very long and they interact very very weakly with ordinary matter so that that frustrating feature for te- checking theory is when you come to the dark matter is, is a blessing because if we, if we, the one thing we know about the dark matter is that it hasn't been detected other than through its uh, gravitational interaction. So, and then other details also fit between the dark matter and the axion. So it's very tempting to think that the, the, the dark matter is made out of axions. And then the, the ex- exciting development of recent years is that we've, as uh, technology has developed uh, and as people have thought harder about what it would take to detect axions, we're actually now just about able to design the kinds of instruments that really have a, a, a realistic chance of detecting this form of dark matter. So. Basically, roughly speaking, we're, we're learning how to build the kinds of antennas that could pick up this signal that's all around us, this, this kind of uh, field or, or lot, lot, lots of light particles that, that according to this, this development of ideas, is what the dark matter is. And if that turns out to be true, it'll be a fantastic triumph because we started by trying to solve an aesthetic problem with the uh, laws of physics as we perceived them, and and were led by that to predicting what seems to be a totally different feature of the universe, namely this dark matter astronomers have observed. Now, this strikes me as something that could be a, a, a game changer. In other words, uh, say you detect the axion and yeah. everything that you, you looked at was correct. All of a sudden we know what dark matter is, or at least one form of it. And then, so that question is, is, is now burst wide open, but also a probe into the early universe at the same time. Yes, that's right. Because the, the axion background would have been produced out of the Big Bang. And I mean, the, the axions would have been produced very early and because their interactions are so weak, they really bear the stamp of the early universe. So, so, so they haven't, they have, they're giving us messages more or less directly from the very, very early universe. So much earlier than the uh, cosmic microwave background, which is our present, the, um, the, our best messenger from the early universe. That, that comes from photons. But photons interact much more strongly than, than axions, so that pro- that signal is more processed. The axions would have come from even earlier and give us real access to the uh, early moments of the Big Bang. They would also, because of their origins in fundamental physics, they would also be telling us about larger theories that extend the laws of physics beyond the standard model. So axions can... Arise. Do one of the strengths of the axion theory is that axions do arise very naturally in many different extensions of the standard model. And once you know, once you have detailed information about axions, you can use that as a lever to learn about uh, lots of other physics beyond the standard model. We know already know that there are weakly interacting particles. Look at the neutrino. Yes, and that in itself is interesting because of suggestions about a, a neutron, a neutrino background that could possibly yes. study. and mm-hmm. couple that with an axion study, and we might have, be able to get a, a real probe into the very first moments of the universe from two angles. Yeah, now, we'll understand. We'll definitely understand things much better. Yeah, so it would, it would be both a uh, well. I think it would. I mean. Look, <laughs> it, it would be one of the great scientific discoveries of all time. So it's a, it would be a great milestone, but it would also be a beacon to, the, to further discoveries. 
Oh, absolutely. You know, science always leads to more mysteries that need solutions, you know? Yeah. And I, we, this uh, this we, sounds like a rich area to me that we're, <laughs> we're going to find some well, of that. I like to say that good answers lead to even better questions. Certainly more informed questions, you know? Yes, um, that's right. Now, interactivity. So we have a weekly interacting axion here. How does that stack up to something like a neutrino or some of the other WIMPs that they've said? I mean, is this really, really hard to detect or is it just something that's, you know, we just need the right equipment? It's really hard to detect. <laughs> There's no question about that. I mean, people have been people have been working on this problem intensely, thousands of physicists literally, for a few decades now. Actually, let me qualify that. It was a relatively quiet field for a while, but certainly in the last 10 years, say, it's become very popular and uh there are definitely there are thousands of physicists and regular conferences where people get together to discuss how they're going to detect axions the latest ideas and things like this and so the prospects are are good well i, I mean well, because it's this pop is popular because the prospects are good and that's why they perceived now my last question about the axion might be a little bit of a strange one, but it's it's uh, it's something I'm just simply curious about. Oh, I'm sorry. You asked me to compare. I, I love, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you, you, I've just remembered sort of what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's late here. Uh, the uh, uh, so you asked me to compare it with neutrinos, and neutrinos have the property that the strength of their interaction with ordinary matter depends on their energy. So we've become quite good at detecting. In neutrinos with high energy but neutrinos of very very low energy are very very challenging to detect and in fact there's a prediction that there's a neutrino background filling the universe and that prediction is very firm i mean the the um, it's it's a very straightforward deduction from what we know that there has to be this neutrino background it would be absolutely shocking if it weren't there however the particles are so difficult to detect that there's no realistic proposal for doing it, even though it's lying out. It's kind of a Nobel Prize for sure for anyone who manages to do it. Uh, they uh, and people have thought a, a lot about it. Uh, it. It seems to be just just too hard, and uh, we need new technology, new ideas, and they're not they're not on the horizon. Uh, axions uh, are not yet detected so uh, the honest answer is we don't know how hard they are to detect <laughs> but but on paper we have proposals that now i think have a realistic shot of detecting them in the next few years if they exist and the good news is one of the things that makes them so difficult to detect is that there's not quite a unique prediction for their mass well, I mean, there's definitely not a unique prediction for their mass. What 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 is true is that it's a so-called one-parameter theory. So once you know its mass, you know basically all its prop other property, but we don't know the mass, and that makes the search very difficult because you have to try to uh, detect a particle whose mass we don't yet know, and that for technical reasons that's quite difficult. We face the same kind of problem in trying to detect the Higgs particle. We didn't know what its mass was going to be, and so it, it took a long, long time to, to, to hone in on it. And you know, so the axion. But once we do know the mass, in the case of axions, then it gets much easier. Then it gets much, much easier. It's similar, very similar, actually, to the existence of a radio transmission some frequency so a ra so a radio channel that's at some frequency we don't know and so if we're trying to dial into it on our on our uh, transistor radios or whatever we don't know it's it's very very difficult because we don't know where to look but once we know where to look it becomes much easier so i think if and when we do make the discovery of of the axion it could the that kind of astronomy that tunes into this background and and studies it in detail and learns other lessons about 
how the universe formed and what the other what the fundamental interactions are as we discussed earlier uh, axions will tell us a lot of could tell us a lot about that once we know the mass those experiments all become much easier and much more feasible so the first step will definitely be the hardest <laughs> and if and when we we make that breakthrough it'll be it'll be relatively easy to build on it now how does one go about naming a particle axion where did that name come from <laughs> well that one i know because i did i did the naming and it goes back to when even before i decided to go into physics uh, when i was uh i don't remember exactly i was either late in my high school career or early in my college career when i was visiting home i uh, accompanied my mother on a trip to the grocery store <laughs> and uh, i noticed up on the shelves there was a kind of laundry detergent named axion i said i said to myself gosh that that's a really nice name that that's really sounds like it should be a particle you know, there, there are pions and neutrons and so and lots of things that are ons or and ions and, and axions is a nice greek name and and I said, gee i said that really sounds like a particle if 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 i ever get the chance to name a particle i'll call it axion and then a few years later <laughs> it the ideas that i mentioned earlier started to uh, uh crystallize to come together and i got to fulfill my dream <laughs> because uh the 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 uh the stars were aligned in a sense because it turns out that at a technical level this particle cleans up a problem with an axial current so i was able to say that to the editors of physical review letters i didn't tell them that i was naming the thing after a laundry detergent i said no there's an axial current that's getting fixed up here and so it got by the the editors and uh and that name has stuck and so that that uh that's how that particular particle got its name it really was literally named after a laundry detergent but now another particle the anion can you give us an overview of that one yes the anion is another of my coinages and uh and I, of course you, you know the the way you get to coin these names is being one of the you know, early people to do it and and develop it and, uh, and recognize the importance of that so so let me give myself a plug there the uh and yeah so anions are a quite different kind of particle than than axions and really different in character whereas axions if they exist will be fundamental particles that have that are, propagate through through empty space and were produced in the early universe and so forth anions are emergent particles what does that mean that means that anions are not fundamental particles they're not a separate element of the universe that we introduce into our basic description rather they are sort of concentrations of energy that have reproducible particles of reproducible properties that have that look like they, they that have many of the properties of particles they're reproducible they they move but they are not in themselves elementary objects they're built up from the collective behavior of ordinary particles namely electrons and protons and so forth so in suitable states of matter in suitable materials you find that there are new kinds of emergent particles emergent concentrations of energy that uh, act like particles some sometimes they're called quasi particles that have qualitatively new properties the the new thing about anions is that they have a sort of memory they when you have several anions and they move around each other their wave function records the way they've moved in a very precise way so the, the this is a new thing under the sun in physics that you can have particles that have a kind of memory so then that that's what anions are and the name derives from the idea that there are the conventionally uh, before anions were 
developed. Physicists thought that there were only two kinds of logically consistent quantum particles, namely bosons and fermions, and they have very restricted properties. Anions are a richer concept that we showed were theoretically consistent and and actually realized in certain states of matter that have less constrained properties so as a kind of joke i said well anything goes for and that and that and uh, and that 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 was the origin of anions so any it's just it's a shorthand for anything goes and it's not true that anything goes as far from truth as far but uh, but but it's a much there's a much richer palette of consistent possibilities than was previously realized and so as a kind of joke i said anything goes and that's the name, that's the origin of that name and, now my last uh, well just to finish that thought the uh this kind of new property that anions can have memory is not only very kind of fundamentally interesting and because it, it's so novel but also might be useful people now are developing anions as a possible element of uh, a quantum computer so it opens up new possibilities so these particles that themselves have memory can actually be useful in information processing and that was my question was uh these this sound these, these sound fundamentally useful if they're you know if they maintain a memory no my last question for you involves something that there has been much said about time crystals Mm -hmm. Could you give us an overview of time crystals? Yes. Well, okay. So let's first des first describe ordinary crystals in a way that leads naturally into the concept of time crystals. So ordinary crystals are or, are orderly patterns of atoms in space. So they the crystals are very symmetric, but they're less symmetric than space itself. Space itself allows you is unchanged if you move an arbitrarily small amount space still has the same properties and the physical laws are the same but if you're in a material that's a crystal uh, it's not true that that uh, you can move just a little bit and nothing changes because if you move a little bit you might move from where an atom is to where an atom isn't <laughs> so the orderly arrangements uh, that are crystals uh, combine have an element of symmetry, but it's less symmetry than than space itself. So now physicists ha are uh, very alert since Einstein, to, or even earlier, to the the, pos the analogies between space and time, which commonly treat time as another dimension and relativity. Space and time uh, get mixed up by tri by uh, w when you move move fast, somebody's space and somebody's time is different from somebody else's space and somebody else's time, and yet they're mutually consistent descriptions of reality. In any case, so I was led to, th to ask whether you have, you could have, instead of orderly arrangements in space, whether you can have orderly but not completely symmetric arrangements of things in time. So the analogy to spatial crystals are these time crystals where you have materials, time crystal is a material in which you have an orderly arrangement of events in time. So they're materials that settle down when they're, uh, that, that have a kind of periodicity. So we know of materials like that. At that level, we know well, hearts, <laughs> human hearts beat. <laughs> and so they have orderly arrangements of things that happen in time or clocks, of course. Uh, the, 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 the essence of a clock is that it, it, has, it has an orderly behavior in time where it goes around in cycles. But the thing about time crystals, the new element that was thought to be very paradoxical and close to ideas about perpetual motion, which are uh, you know, scary to physicists, uh, most physicists. <laughs> but the, the thing about time crystals is that they are materials in which that kind of behavior develops spontaneously. So 
hearts need a lot of care and feeding and clocks need to be carefully constructed and wound up or plugged into the wall or something. Time crystals are basically clock-like objects or clock-like things that, that develop spontaneously, that don't, don't, they are states of matter that have this kind of orderly arrangement in time as, as that, that forms spontaneously, just as crystals will form spontaneously if you take, a, take an appropriate material and, and cool it down slowly out of solution. So time crystals are that are, are things that spontaneously form clocks, if you like. <laughs> All right, Doctor, we are out of time. I want to thank you, or uh, I want to thank you for appearing with us. And I also want to congratulate you on your recently being awarded the Templeton Prize and indeed the Nobel. And thank you. My, yes. And um, I'm a lucky guy. <laughs> now, where can everybody find the beautiful question? Well, I mean, you, it, it's uh, for sale widely, I guess, at bookstores, but, but, but also certainly online. It's very easy to, to, to just dial it up and uh at amazon or whatever you can do it's readily it should be readily available and my new book fundamentals is even more so yeah so if you want a portal into my work in general that's not a book but but has a lot of resources and columns i wrote for the wall street journal you can look at my website frankawilchek.com find lots of stuff more than you want to know about me and my work <laughs> All right. Thank you, doctor. Okay. Thank you. It was fun. (laughs) Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice.